So my name is Bob Jensen. I uh, work at the University of Texas at Austin. And if, I'm not going to read so much as try to talk about where this book came from and why I think it's important. First, I want to point out, you know, you, you write a book years before it's published. It turned out this was published in mid-January, roughly at the same time in which other things were happening, such as the inauguration of a new president. And um, it turns out that the title, The End of Patriarchy, wasn't accurate, apparently. Uh, that uh, my predictive skills were apparently a bit off, as evidenced by the election of a president who asserted a deep commitment to patriarchy. But the obvious point is, if the election had turned out differently, it would have still been an inaccurate <laughs> title. So we should recognize that the title, The End of Patriarchy, is aspirational, <laughs> not descriptive. Right? I'm not suggesting we're at the end of patriarchy. It's a goal. The subtitle, Radical Feminism for Men, also requires a little bit of discussion. Uh, I'm male, and a lot of my work over the last nearly three decades now has been in feminism, especially radical feminism. And I've always understood my role in that movement not to be to tell women what to think or how to understand their own experience, but to work with feminist ideas and articulate them in ways that are accessible to men, hence the subtitle. But I also want to make it clear, I think the book is perhaps relevant for women as well. Um, so both parts of the title need a bit of explanation. The other part of the title uh, that I should talk about a bit are the terms patriarchy and radical feminism. So patriarchy, for those of us in the room old enough to remember decades gone by, was a subject of much discussion. Uh, when you talk about the second wave of feminism starting in the late 60s into the 70s, there was a lot of talk about patriarchy as the social system out of which sexist ideas, sexist behaviors arose and the need to go to the source and challenge patriarchy. You don't hear about that so much these days. Yes? In fact, sometimes when I'll talk about patriarchy in a class with uh, undergraduates at the University of Texas, it will literally be the first time they've heard the term used in, in that fashion. So part of the book is meant to just remind us that the term is still relevant and it still matters. Radical feminism also often dis requires some discussion because, again, if you go back 30, 40 years, uh, in pop culture, in, the, in everyday life, people were talking about these things and the term radical feminism would have had meaning. Folks would have understood what it meant. And today, it often doesn't. Uh, radical feminism doesn't immediately conjure up for people a particular political philosophy necessarily. So a lot of the book is both trying to articulate what we mean by the term patriarchy and talk a bit about where it comes from and why it's still a relevant term. Right? By that we simply mean patriarchy as a, a term for institutionalized male dominance, right? a system in which men hold the vast majority of positions of power and influence and wield that power in ways that systematically subordinate women. Right? Uh, now, when you think about the success of the women's movement in the second wave, some people would say, well, patriarchy is no longer relevant because we've transcended patriarchy. That in fact, there's no such thing as institutionalized male dominance after all. Uh, a, a woman almost captured the highest political office in the land. How can, after all, how can you talk about patriarchy if a woman was nearly elected president, it seems ridiculous, yes? So a lot of what we have to come to terms with is that political resistance, political movements, movements for liberation of various forms, do make advances against really deeply embedded systems of unearned power and privilege. White supremacy in the United States today does not look like it did in 1958 when I was born. Right? And one of the consequences of that is for two terms, we had an African-American president. But of course, that fact did not mean that a system of white supremacy had magically disappeared in the United States. And the same with patriarchy. So we need to keep 
our eye on the ball. And in this case, uh, over and over again, I reassert we need to think about systems. We need to think about systems and structures of power, the institution that comes out of those systems, and how to keep an eye on that as well. Right. And patriarchy is one of those systems, along with white supremacy, from my point of view, capitalism, US imperial domination of the world, uh, and in some sense, perhaps the most overwhelming of these, the human attempt to control the entire non-human world uh, what some people have called a form of human supremacy. So there's no shortages of places to keep our eye on the ball. In this book, I'm focusing on patriarchy and feminism. Right? I want to just say one more thing about patriarchy before I move on to the feminist part, which is to remember that in its, in its, at its core, patriarchy is very much a bodily phenomenon. It's about control of women's bodies. The core of patriarchy is about attempts to, men's attempts to control women's reproductive and sexual power. And still, to this day, a lot of the, the struggles that I think are most central to the challenge of patriarchy involve that reproductive and sexual power. And here it's important to recognize that threats to women's attempts to control their own lives come from all sides of the political uh, arena so that the most common threat to women's control over their own bodies in reproductive terms tends to come from the right wing, from the conservative position in American politics, overwhelmingly from the Republican Party. The flashpoint is abortion rights, of course. I don't make assumptions about how everybody in the room thinks about it. But for feminism, a core commitment is to advocate for women's control over their own bodies in the reproductive arena. And the main struggle is against a particular political formation that we can call conservative. Okay? In the realm of sexuality, it gets a little more complicated, in part because while there's a fair amount of consensus in feminism about reproductive rights and abortion, there is no consensus in feminism around the questions of sexuality. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but from the position I want to argue for, uh, we're talking about men's attempts to control women's sexuality, which do still come from the right in certain ways, but also come from the left and the liberal perspective. So in, in my work resisting what I call the sexual exploitation industries of primarily pornography and prostitution, the main struggle is with the political left with the liberal establishment, which wants to, from my point of view, keep women's bodies available to men as freely as possible. So this isn't simply a book that critiques right-wing Christian Republicans. It's a book that thinks about patriarchy in an expansive way and realizes that in some ways there can be a kind of conservative and liberal patriarchy flip sides of the same coin that we have to think carefully about. All right. So that's just a quick way to think about patriarchy as a, a very powerful system still alive and well and that we need to be able to talk about. So feminism, let me say a few things about feminism again because a lot of what I'm doing in this book is just basic terminology because especially in pop culture these terms are used often without a lot of consensus on definition. So feminism for me has always been both a, a, an intellectual enterprise and a political enterprise. What I mean by that is feminism helped me think about the world and it also provided a vehicle for action in the world, analysis and action. And both of those things are very important. Um, we often think, well, we need to act, right? It's enough talking. But talking is very important because talking is how we come to understand the world and our actions in the world need to be informed by an understanding, a coherent understanding of the world. So for me, uh, a lot of people think about feminism only as a political movement. For me, it's also an intellectual enterprise as well. And a very powerful one that when I went to graduate school back in 1988, really changed the way I think about the world. Uh, feminism is also uh, both a critique for me of sex gender oppression. It's a critique of patriarchy. But it's also, for me, a, a deeper critique of hierarchy more generally. That a feminist analysis of the world doesn't simply look at 
men's violence against women, let's say, and analyze that. It also steps back and, and understands that the core problem is hierarchy and the way that, in fact, all of modern life, for the most part, is structured on hierarchies which try to, to assert themselves as natural. Right? That's the big con that hierarchy does. Uh, because most of us understand at some level that hierarchy is inconsistent with decent human interaction. Right? Whenever there's hierarchy where one group has power over another, I'm sure some of you have figured it out. Bad things tend to happen, yes? Right? So hierarchy is a sort of uh, a, a very explicit challenge to our own moral and, and political philosophies yet we accept them everywhere and the key is of course hierarchy tries to assert that it is natural it's, you know, it's just the way you know why are men dominant over women well because we're stronger and we're smarter we're more moral all the things that you know history has tried to persuade us about uh, and so for me feminism is both a critique of a particular gender politics but also a larger critique of hierarchy and it's important to recognize that it's, it's not the only critique of hierarchy that exists in the world. From other traditions, you get critiques of hierarchy. And the way I tend to think about it is, if you take seriously the way power operates in this world, and you start to critique it, it's most likely that you're going to enter into that analysis through one particular issue. Right? For some people, it's racial injustice. For some people, it's gender. For some people, it's economic inequality. You know, there's lots of ways to, to start to realize, oh, this hierarchy thing is the problem. Uh, for me, it just happened to be that the first door I opened back in 1988 was the gender door, just by accident of history. Right? But once through that, it seems to me it's really incumbent on us to not stay focused on that one question only, but to expand out, and that's what feminism did for me. All right. Now, I'm making an argument for radical feminism. Uh, and for those who go back a ways, you know that at one point, there were if you had the list of you know, varieties of feminism. It would have been a couple of dozen. You know, there was Marxist feminist and social fe socialist feminism and psychoanalytic feminism and cultural feminism, this and that. And uh, for purposes of simplicity, I'm going to suggest that today in the contemporary United States, if people are talking about feminism, there's really two, t two types. What I'm going to call liberal feminism and radical feminism. Now, under this umbrella term of liberal feminism, I'm going to also put for those who've run into these terms, postmodern feminism, which I think is just a version of liberalism, or third wave feminism, which is typically attached to generational differences. But to me, it's all just a version of liberal feminism, and I want to argue for a radical feminism. So what's the difference? Well, in some ways, the difference parallels other kinds of political tr critiques where liberal, liberalism and liberals tend to want to look at existing systems and figure out how to make them more fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. So a liberal critique of capitalism, for instance, tends to not ask the question, is justice possible within capitalism? The answer is no, by the way. Uh, it tends to say, here's a capitalist economy. How are we going to use things like tax policy and redistribution to make it more fair and equitable? And I'm not making fun of those efforts. They're very important especially in the short term. A radical approach steps back and tends to look at the nature of the system itself. Right. So in some sense, the difference between liberal and radical feminism, I think, parallels that. But a, a more important difference is liberal feminism, including these other terms I'm using, postmodern, third wave feminism, it seemed to me are also liberal in the very foundational way that they're obsessed with individual choices. And they tend to focus on individual choices within systems. Now, I, I like being able to choose. I'm not saying choice and the ability to choose within whatever the realities of power in the moment are is irrelevant. It's not. But again, I think a radical feminist perspective steps back and says not what is it, you know, how do we maximize choices within the system? But ask the question, what are the conditions under which people choose? And I'm going to come back to that in a minute as well. Uh, so here's one way to also say this, and this is a bit of an unfair comparison, because I'm going to suggest that the kind of the quintessential mainstream liberal feminism right now would be CEO 
Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In. So if you know this story, Sheryl Sandberg is CEO, C she's, she's a big wig at Facebook. I forget what the title is. And she wrote a very important book, important in the sense it had a lot of influence, called Lean In. And the whole idea was for feminism, for women, you have to be able to not step back and be quiet and demure, but lean in. So if you're in a corporate setting and you don't think you're being paid enough, lean in. You know, make, be more assertive within this system. All right. Uh, that's a kind of quintessential liberalism, almost a, a self-caricatured liberalism. Because, of course, for someone who's a multimillionaire working in one of the three biggest corporations in America, to talk about leaning in, you know, there were some predictable responses. Like, okay, does her uh, housekeeper, probably a woman, lean in when you know, asking Sheryl Sandberg for something that resembles equity? Uh, it's almost, as I said, self-caricaturing expressions of privilege. Okay, but when I was thinking about the difference between liberal and feminism, I was thinking about Sheryl Sandberg and Andrea Dworkin. Andrea Dworkin is the, one of the quintessential radical feminists, um, died sadly more than a decade ago now. But I was thinking of a, a speech I once saw on video of Andrea's where she said, if you know what needs to be torn down, Andrea said, tear it down. And I thought, if Andrea were alive when Sheryl Sandberg's book was published, uh, I'm now trying to channel the spirit of Andrea Dworkin, which I'm wholly uh, unqualified to do. But she would have said, no, no, it's not lean in, it's lean on. Lean on patriarchy till it crumbles. Right? Tear it down. And uh, I think that's an important distinction. Okay. Let me quote Andrea again, uh, because there are a few people in my life who, if not but for their existence, I wouldn't be the person I am. Some of them are people I know quite well. Andrea, I finally did meet Andrea once later in her life, but it was through her writing that, that I was changed. And uh, a book that was very powerful for me called Letters from a War Zone, which was a collection of Andrea's essays and speeches published in 1988, which was the year I began graduate school, was uh, one of those books, I'm sure you've all had particular books that just whacked you upside the head <laughs> and made you think differently. And this is one of them for me. Uh, in a, a very... Uh, important essay called Feminism and Agenda in Letters from a War Zone, she, in typical Andrea Dworkin fashion, was blunt. She said, in describing feminism, this is a movement against suffering. She said, we live in a society in which you're supposed to be happy, yes? It's, it's almost a crime not to be happy in America. My God, what's wrong with you? Uh, and we know what you're supposed to do if you're not happy. There are two things you can do. You can go shopping or take a pill, yes? The, you know, it, the, the most un-American thing in the world is to be unhappy. And typically we spend money to counter that feeling. And Andrea said that is exactly the wrong instinct. When you're bumping up against your pain, she said, the most important thing is to be able to feel the pain. And, and also quoting from that essay, she said, one of the things that women's movement does is to make you feel the pain. And I think that's what radical feminism does. So for anybody here who's not familiar with radical feminism, my sales pitch to you is sign up, join the club, you will feel the pain. <laughs> Which doesn't feel like a great sales pitch, you know. I'm not in sales, but um, in a way, th the pitch is that that pain is there. Right? If you are awake and alive and aware, you will feel it. Right? And you have two choices. One is to deny and to deflect and to divert. And the question is what happens, you know, if you think on your individual, at the level of your individual life, what happens when you try to divert yourself from pain? It doesn't tend to work very well. Right? Eventually it comes up again and grabs you. If you're successful at repressing it completely, that's even worse uh, because then in some sense you're lost. You'll never feel again. And so, although it doesn't sound very attractive to say feel the pain, I think that is in fact the only 
sane response to it, is to go through it to try to get somewhere on the other side of it to make sense of it so that when you do feel it, it's not chaotic. I'm, I'm going to quote, uh, James Baldwin is on my mind today. Number one, because almost every day James Baldwin is on my mind <laughs> because he's another one of those writers who whacked me upside the head 35 years ago, 30 years ago. So James Baldwin, uh, the great novelist, um, playwright, essayist, uh, uh, who is the subject of a brand new documentary called I Am Not Your Negro, which is playing here, and happily I'm going to go see later today. Uh, Baldwin is, a, uh, like Andrea Dworkin, another one of those writers from the second half of the 20th century who I think challenged us to rethink the way we understand the world. And I was watching uh, an interview online with Baldwin, who also sadly died too young uh, back in about 87. And he was, he was the, the interviewer was asking him about his childhood. James Baldwin was uh, poor, black, and gay in pre-civil rights America. Uh, and so that wasn't an easy way to live, obviously. And, and the interviewer was asking about the terror that he felt as a child. And he said, yeah, of course there was terror. Uh, and then in classic James Baldwin, he kind of stopped and paused and smiled. And he said, well, you know the thing about terror. You got two choices. Right? You can run away. But he said, better to run toward it. At least then you know what hit you. <laughs> And I think that's the spirit of Andrea and of radical feminism. Looking away doesn't help you. Better to run toward it, and then you know what hit you. And so that's what radical feminism helped me understand, that it wasn't about searching for rights within an existing system, a classic liberal approach. It was really about liberation from the system. And that's why then I could see myself in radical feminism, that it was not simply a, a movement to win rights for women, which are not trivial. Again, I'm not making light of that. But it was, it was a way of thinking about liberation more generally. And then as a man, I could think about why and how I needed to be liberated from the very toxic conception of masculinity that I was raised with. And to a large degree, men and, or boys are still raised with today. I think the US is a very different world than the one I was born into in 1958. And that's all to the good. But I think that very toxic definition of masculinity, masculinity defined as control, right? The most important thing about being a man is being in control, which means you're always aimed at conquest, right? You must control the terrain, which inevitably means the kind of conflict that only ends with you conquering, which leads to levels of aggression that we're all familiar with, including overt violence, right? So, that kind of conception of masculinity wasn't really very attractive to me because although I'm kind of an average size adult male, as a kid, I was a classic short, skinny, effeminate kid, confused about his own sexuality, not at all clear about anything, only knowing that the world was dangerous for people who were short, boys who were short, skinny, and effeminate. And so I never, as a kid, felt like I was really a real man. When I got older and, and grew and sort of learned how to play the game a bit, especially in my 20s, I did my best to, to be a man. And it won't surprise you, I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> I, I tried. I, you know, I tried to be a guy who you know, drank and talked about women's bodies and you know, blah, blah, blah. It, I was an abject failure at it. In both of those settings, I wasn't very happy. And so I knew I needed to find something. And for me, it was this radical feminist critique that talked about liberation in a way that I could find myself in. But what was interesting is after I started working in feminism and started talking to lots of men, often in formal interview projects, sometimes informally, I, I really discovered something quite interesting, that those guys I had grown up with that I thought were the real men, like literally a friend of mine in high school was the high school quarterback. Um, the kind of quintessential expression of masculinity in patriarchy. Turns out they're miserable too because virtually every man I've ever met at some point in his life felt I'm not man enough. In a previous book called Getting Off that was specifically about pornography, I called that king of the hill masculinity. So I don't know if any of you remember the, or even kids play king of the hill anymore. It was a game that was common when I was young. 
And it's, you know, the rules aren't very complex. There's a hill of some sort. In my case, it was a gravel pile behind the water utility, and we'd climb over the fence. And, and somebody's at the top, the king, and everybody else tries to pull the king down. And as a kind of analogy to masculinity, it's very instructive because if you're a man in a patriarchal society, your goal is to be the king, and life is pretty shitty. Oh, I forgot. Life is not pleasant uh, because you're constantly chasing something. Right? You're, you're, you are never satisfied because there is always a, another step you must take to be a real man. And of course, life isn't that great for the king either because... What are the other men trying to do? Pull down the king. It's this state of constant conflict. And I think a lot of men feel that even with friends, even with close male friends, there's this sense of a kind of constant conflict. It's, it's true that that kind of system produces for men short-term material benefits. Yes? I have benefited in extraordinary ways from being a male in this culture, just like I've benefited from being white and being a US citizen and all sorts of other things. But there's a trade-off, right? And feminism allowed me to see myself within that liberatory struggle and to see other men in it as well. All right. I'm going to end uh, quickly, and then we'll open it up for conversation. So the book builds from talking about uh, these fundamental questions of male, female, patriarchy, feminism, and then looks at three issues uh, and asks the question, what does radical feminists help us understand about these three issues? Uh, the first one is sexual violence, the question of rape. The second is what I call the sexual exploitation industries, pornography and prostitution primarily. And the third is the underlying ideology behind the transgender movement. Uh, and in some ways, in each chapter, I try to say something that is challenging the dominant culture uh, and also challenging the liberal feminist view of the world within the movement. Uh, the one that is most contentious these days is the critique of the transgender movement, which I'll leave for Q&A if you want to talk about it. But I want to go back because so much of my work has been around pornography and prostitution uh, to point out the difference between a liberal and a radical approach and why I think this is so important. It's also a way to, in a sense, honor Andrea uh, because when I stand up in public, I never know how it's going to feel, but when someone had that profound a, an effect on your life and we collectively lost her, um, it always feels important to honor that. And in the late 70s, uh, Andrea started writing about pornography and providing a really quite innovative and new critique. Prior to that, if you talked about pornography in contemporary American culture, there was a conservative, typically Christian, religious critique and a liberal defense. So if this were, you know, 1968, it would be right-wing Christians. At that time, it was typically the Catholic Church. Later, it became more evangelical Protestants. Today, the conservative critique of porn tends to come out of the Mormon Church. It's a lot of LDS folks. And they would be arguing against the secular, uh, liberal establishment, you know, typified by the ACLU. So you'd have, you know, a, a religious, a religiously rooted critique against a secular defense, uh, and the feminist critique that Andrea pioneered really exploded that dichotomy, and changed the way we think about pornography. Uh, and by the early '80s, this was a, a very contentious topic within the United States. States there were legislative proposals to change the law. By the late 80s, when I got involved, the anti-porn movement in feminism was starting to dwindle. Its uh, influence was much less. And by the time I graduated in 1992, the feminist anti-pornography movement was literally almost over. It's been restarted recently, and there's some interesting work going on. But the liberal perspective won out. Not only the liberal, secular liberal male defense of pornography, but within feminism, a liberal defense of pornography, again, focused on choice. All right. So again, we, we want to maximize choices, but we always have to think about the system within which people choose. Because every time any one of us makes a choice, we are acting with some opportunities and some constraints. 
No choice is ever free in an absolute sense. We're always working under a system that provides opportunities and constraints. So what are the constraints and opportunities? And then you have to look at the real world in which m women make choices to perform in pornography and, and prostitution. And then all of a sudden, you're in the real world and there are much more complex questions. That's what radical feminism helped me understand. And it took something that was normalized in my life back in the 80s and 90s, men's use of pornography, right? and had forced me to rethink that. And as a quote unquote normal guy, I of course had used pornography, and it was this direct challenge to me. What's so interesting about this, and why I think not my book so much as radical feminism is important, is think about the two decades since the feminist anti-pornography movement failed. Okay, what has happened to pornography? Well, there's more of it, more easily accessible, including to increasingly younger uh, people, primarily younger men, but not exclusively younger men. It is, the content of pornography is more overtly cruel and degrading to women than ever, and also, interestingly, more overtly racist than ever. Pornography is the only mass media genre in the United States where you will see overt racism without any challenge. Okay? So there's more of it. It's being accessed by younger and younger people. It's more overtly cruel and violent, more overtly racist, more overtly degrading. And the culture seems to have abandoned any critique of it. Right? Uh, turns out Andrea was kind of spot on on this one, yes? In fact, I think if Andrea were alive today, she, even she would be shocked at the routine content that you can find, any one of us can find on our phone or our computer with a simple web search. Right? So radical feminism, and this is where I'll conclude, uh, radical feminism seems like an old-fashioned idea right, that a bunch of possibly crazy women back 40 years ago came up with, yes? And to me, it is not. It is as compelling today, in fact, in some ways, more compelling than ever, and more important to keep alive. It is not the reigning version of feminism you will find in the average women's studies department at a university, certainly at the University of Texas at Austin, where I teach, one of the five biggest campuses in the country. It is not a popular perspective within women's studies where I teach. Um, but it is, I think, a very compelling critique that needs to be discussed. So uh, let's end with the, the men part again, uh, because that subtitle, Radical for Feminism for Men, is a bit deceptive. It's not really a book I wrote only for men, but it's my experience and important. One of the ways I pitch to men uh, this claim that radical feminism has something for us that is, in addition to an argument from justice, which is always there, yes, that men should participate in a feminist movement to critique male power and privilege because it's the right thing to do if you're really serious about your own moral principles about equity and dignity. Right? Now, some of you may have noticed that when you make an argument from justice to, pe to people in positions of unearned power and privilege, it's not always persuasive. Have you noticed that? Yes, okay. So I think it's important for just practical reasons, if nothing else, to make an argument from self-interest, right? That yes, you should do the right thing, but if you need a little more motivation to do the right thing, here, it's in your own self-interest. And that's what I've been trying to argue for the last 25 years. Uh, as difficult in some ways as my life is today, and you know, my life is hard like everybody's, I would never go back to the period before I engaged feminism. That you couldn't pay me enough to go back to that pre-feminist Bob Jensen. I wouldn't do it for a million dollars. And the reason is quite simple, not because I'm so smart or so noble, right, but because I'm self-interested in some capacity just like others. And what I learned from radical feminism is that I had a choice. I could be a man in the sense that patriarchy asserts what it means to be a man. I could accept that and accept the short-term material benefits that come with it. I could be a man or I could be a human being, but I couldn't be both. 
that to accept that conception of masculinity was to surrender some of my own humanity. And that's a bad deal. Right? It's a bad deal not only in a kind of principled way, but in terms of my life experience, however difficult it is to, to, to you know, run toward the terror so you know what hit you, uh, it produces, a, in my experience, a much richer and more fulfilling life. It is purely selfish in that sense that I want to remain engaged with feminism. Because given the choice between being a man and being a human being, I would argue strongly for the latter. And, and that's where I want to end also because it allows us to also think about those other hierarchies because a feminist perspective to me is never simply about gender. Right? I think you can make the same kind of argument in other hierarchies. So I'm white, in case it wasn't clear. Bob Jensen, I'm from North Dakota. Like, I'm the whitest person in the world. Right? White name, white state, pasty white skin, that's me. Uh, I would argue in some sense I can be white and embrace what white means in a white supremacist society, or I can be a human being, but I can't be both. I'm right now in my life fairly comfortable materially. I'm a professor. I get a reasonably decent salary. Right. I can, I'm not part of the 1%, but I'm part of the top 20. I looked up my own income once, and I was kind of surprised. I'm in the top 20% of American taxpayers. That's not bad. And I can accept that affluence and embrace what it means in capitalism, or I can be a human being. I don't think I can be both. Right? I hold a US passport. I was born in the United States. I can be an American and embrace all of the American exceptionalist rhetoric, or I can be a human being, but I don't think I can be both. I think that is really the choice we face when we are born through you know, actions of our own into unearned privilege and power. You can, you can embrace that system that produces the unearned privilege and power because it does deliver to you some short-term material benefits. Or you can struggle to be as fully human as you can be. And we all fail at that, you know, regularly. Right? I'm not claiming some state of moral perfection. But simply that struggle to be fully human is important. And that brings us back to the other part, uh, which in some ways is perhaps the most distressing reality in the world today, which is that the human claim to control the non-human world, and call it human supremacy, whatever you want, right? that idea that we can in fact intervene and run the world, especially in this era of high energy, high technology, right? is really in some ways the most distressing. And we all have to collectively find a way to try and be in the world, in sync with the world in a different way. Uh, and that's where this led me, right? not only to a critique of a variety of ways in which men subordinate women, but this greater question about hierarchy more generally. So let me see, uh, upbeat ending. OK. It's very important. It's well known, especially if you want to sell books that you have to have an upbeat ending. And so in a spirit of collaboration, I would like to suggest that one of you provide the upbeat ending. Please, I don't have one quick and dirty here. So uh, comments, questions, challenges? Some of what I think led to the downfall of the first woman president, which seemed to be an almost sure thing, mm -hmm. was the way in which she and the power structure of her party were not at all radical feminists, yeah. but corporate. Okay. And so what they did was not at all un unusual in politics. Okay. It was typical of what happens in politics, yeah. but it was women doing it. I would suggest that there's a lot in what you say I would agree with, that uh, it was it, the, the last election was complicated. It was both exciting to see the possibility of a woman in the White House, independent of her politics. In the same way, I was not a huge fan of the politics of Barack Obama, which to me aren't that different than Hillary Clinton's in a lot of ways. And I was excited to see an African American in the White House, but I didn't celebrate in a sense. Okay? Uh, so first of all, we can recognize that although it may be symbolic in certain ways, symbols are important. Second, Hillary Clinton, my critique of Hillary Clinton would be the same critique of Bill Clinton, of Al Gore, of that whole crowd that was part of a 
process in the Democratic Party that shifted the Democratic Party to the right. You use the term corporate Democrats, the neoliberal shift in the Democratic Party, which to me is part of a larger and very disturbing shift in American politics more generally over the last 40 years. The end of the New Deal consensus, the, the attempt to return to a very harsh libertarian conception of capitalism that will not only destroy human society, but the whole world. Okay, so I'm not a big fan. Right? It's also true there was incredible sexism leveled at Hillary Clinton. And this is the nature of a complex world. Both things are true. Some of that sexism, most of that sexism came from outside the Democratic Party, but some of it did come from within the party, and some of it came from Sanders supporters. Right? That's also accurate. Uh, I voted, just, it won't be hard to predict, I voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary and I voted for Hillary Clinton in the general election, which I believe still was the appropriate um, action. Okay. So all of that's true. Hillary Clinton is part of this liberal family. To the degree Hillary Fem Clinton could be called a feminist at all, and I'm not sure what degree you would use that term for, it's squarely within this liberal feminist component, but it's the neoliberal corporate dominated version of that. And I agree completely, that's a dead end, right? It's not going to appeal to anyone because to people who are really under the gun, it's just more of the same elite control, right? Uh, but at the same time, the election flushed out a lot of the, the really harsh patriarchal feeling underneath it, right? A reassertion of men. And the election of Donald Trump is often I, um, analyzed in terms of economics, working class men, but it was also a reassertion, as you pointed out, of, of that racial, economic, and gendered component. And it reminds us how deeply embedded in everyday life all three of these systems are, right? The assertions of naturalized hierarchies in race, class, and gender. And this election had it in spades. And to me, it was also a demonstration that uh, liberalism will not save us, right? Not exactly an original or unique analysis, but I think it's a very instructive thing to go over. Yeah. I'm wondering within radical feminism if you could talk about the rules of radical feminist theologies. Oh. Because are we in a position where so much of patriarchal dynamics yeah. are rooted in a, in yeah. a theological aesthetic, yeah. and yet we're trying to come at it yeah. and deconstruct it from some type of a secular paradigm? Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. And, uh, as I've gotten older, I've spent a lot more time thinking about religion than I did when I was younger. So uh, there is, within feminism and within radical feminism, uh, both a, a, just a straightforward critique, almost an assault on organized religion, primarily you know, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and also attempts to work within it and rework it. Right? Uh, so one of the most well-known people in that was Mary Daly. Mary Daly, who started out as a Catholic theologian, wrote a very important book called Beyond God the Father, which includes that famous line, which I'll paraphrase, once God is man, then men are God. Right? A very pithy way of summing up what's wrong with a, a male God. All right. Mary Daly eventually left Christianity completely and became a quite radical thinker in some ways that were useful, some ways maybe not quite so. But lots of women within these religious traditions continue to try and reclaim an, other, a, an alternative interpretation, which I think is very important, partly because it reminds us that every scripture that was ever written is ambiguous and often internally contradictory. And the claim that religious, conservative religious forces make to authoritative and definitive interpretations is always a lie. Because you look at the Christian New Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is the Quran, there is no single definitive authoritative interpretation possible because they are complex, multifaceted, and often internally contradictory texts. Right? And so this claim to rework them is sometimes almost um, uh, insulted as simply a failed attempt because you're so committed to this old patriarchal system. But I think there's another way to think about it. Um, those stories, so I was raised Protestant, not in a terribly religious household, but I learned all those stories. And those stories are every bit as much mine as they are, um, I was going to date myself and say Jerry Falwell, who's been dead for at least a decade now. 
Jerry Falwell Jr., or whatever his kid's name is, who's a big Trump supporter, I think. I own those stories, too. You do. We all do. And, and struggling for what those stories mean is really important. And those stories have multiple interpretations. And, and so I think that's a terrain on which not everybody wants to fight, but it's an important terrain on which to fight. I haven't kept up with feminist theology so much, but it's a very rich field. It, and I'm guessing you know a lot more about it than I do, by virtue of your no, question. Incorrect. Okay. Uh, but I want to know more. Yeah, and so, and, and like anything, there's, you know, a lot of, let me use this to make a different point. A lot of people uh, ding, especially old second wave radical feminism, with being uh, too white. Okay. Well, is there a political movement? in the United States except those explicitly focused on racial justice that at some point didn't have that problem and doesn't still struggle with that problem. I don't know of one, the labor movement, the environmental movement, the gay rights movement. I mean, this is part of living in a white supremacist society. But in my experience within feminism, feminism as well as has done as good a job as any other movement of trying to, to take that criticism seriously and move forward. And so not only is there feminist critiques of traditional theology, but there are third world religious, you know, there's women of color, there's black liberation theology within the Christian tradition. I'm friends with such a person in Austin who's doing really amazing work coming out of the black conservative church, but reinterpreting that experience in all sorts of great ways. So it's, it's like everywhere else, the pockets of resistance and critical thinking are scattered everywhere. There's, there's not a unified movement anywhere. And so wherever it, it's happening, I'm thumbs up. What's one thing that you think can bring an end to patriarchy? Here's what I would say. Uh, it may be that there is no way to bring it to an end. In the same way that I would love to see contemporary corporate capitalism evaporate, devolve into some, okay. I'd love to see white supremacy transcended by America within my lifetime. It may not be in the cards, okay? There are systems of, of power and oppression that are so entrenched that there may be no way to transcend them, at least not in any form we would recognize through movements that change systems, okay? None of us know what's coming. Uh, that said, there is always work to do in the hopes that we can push the society in the right direction. So before we started, I was talking uh, with Seth and Michael about a friend of mine, Gail Dines, who uh, I think of as kind of the natural successor to Andrea in terms of leading the anti-porn movement. Um, and she's working on a new approach. Uh, so I'll pitch her group. It's called Culture Reframed. And after many years of working with Gail, we're trying to persuade people that a radical feminist critique of pornography was important and where we got nowhere, uh, Gail said, let's think of new ways to talk about this. One of the things this country does is respond to concerns about public health. The, the success against the tobacco industry eventually was a public health campaign. Right? Uh, things like Mothers Against Drunk Drive, things that have had admittedly success in very limited kind of ways, but have had success have often been presented as public health campaigns. And so Gail said, let's suggest that the critique of pornography rooted in our feminist politics is really the public health crisis of the digital age. That the effect of pornography use on especially young boys who are developing sexually now from as early as eight, nine, 10 years old with ac instant access to images of the sexualization of women's subordination. Right? Let's start thinking about this. And she's been talking to nurses, pediatricians, uh, people who work in public health because they're seeing the effects of this. Right? And so there are creative ways to stay true to the spirit of radical feminism and also think creatively. Right? The other thing is to remember that things like rape crisis centers and domestic violence shelters which did not exist prior to the 1970s, exist because of radical feminism, and they need to be supported. And there are, a lot of them have lost their radical feminist politics. 
if you go to the Rape Crisis Center in Austin, Texas, where I live, and say, I'm here because I want to continue the work of radical feminism, some of them will look at you and say, what's that? I mean, literally, the movement has shifted away from, but it doesn't mean that the, the spirit of that can't be you know, present. So there's all sorts of ways that we can all contribute, uh, and they're going to take a lot of creativity. But in the end, I don't know. We may be sunk people, yeah. What would it be like yeah. to create an organization at its root that didn't have that aspect of yeah. it? It's important because, you know, you want to both get things done, which is about efficiency, which leads us to want to replicate hierarchies. That's why every rape crisis center in America has an executive director with an assistant, and, you know, it looks indistinguishable from a, a corporate uh, organizational chart. Is that good or bad? Well, these are the things that, you know, I think are worth talking about. There's a fancy term for it in political science. They call it prefigurative politics. In other words, while the whole system is still structured by hierarchy, within resistance and, and movements, you try to, to imagine a different. You prefigure the, the world you want to see. Last point, Bryce. Go ahead. I wanted to ask about uh, sex work legalization, yeah. uh, public health harm reduction policy. Yeah, that's, a, that's one place where within feminism there's a huge debate. So there's a lot to talk about. Okay, but the, the liberal feminist perspective on pornography and prostitution, first of all, describes that as sex work. So let's just talk about prostitution. The, there's a fundamental difference you can see in the language. Sex work treats prostitution as work, like any other kind of work. Whereas from a radical perspective, you'll never hear a radical feminist use the term sex work. They'll talk about women who are prost... In, in fact, a lot of radical feminists don't even use the word prostitute because it implies something about the woman. Right? And obviously, men and boys are used in prostitution as well, so I don't want to pretend otherwise. But the, the central dynamic of prostitution is men buying women. And so... Radical feminists will talk about women who are prostituted, for instance. All right, so if sex work, if prostitution is just like any other work, then you want to maximize choices and all of that. And a lot of the energy in, in this sort of what I'm calling liberal feminism is toward harm reduction, recognizing that when sex work in this context is criminalized, then it creates very specific health and safety dangers for women, which is, of course, true. So the solution there is typically to decriminalize or even legalize prostitution and imagine sex worker unions and this kind of thing. All right. The radical feminist response is that the goal isn't harm reduction, it's abolition. All right. Because inevitably that when you normalize the buying and selling of women's bodies, you are exposing women to harm and there's no way around that. You simply cannot change it because the dynamic is one of control, conquest, and abuse. That prostitution is inherently leads to that. And the solution is not harm reduction, even if in short-term ways that might make sense. It's the goal is abolition. Right? It's to abolish the notion that I have a right to use you sexually. And the way I talk about this is these sexual exploitation industries really are ways, again, recognizing boys and men are also pulled into this but are ways that men buy objectified female bodies for sex. That's what prostitution is. It's men claiming the right to buy objectified female bodies for sex, right? reducing a full human being to body parts that can sexually satisfy me. And the question I ask in the book is, if our shared goal is gender justice, and I assume everybody here would share that, can you imagine a society reaching any sort of meaningful level of gender justice when you are defined as part of a class that can be bought and sold for sex, and I'm defined as part of a class that can do the buying. It seems to me that it's impossible to imagine transcending that foundational definition and having anything that looks like justice. But go ahead. So would radical feminists object to any sort of short-term goal of uh, legalizing it? The, the, the radical feminist position to the degree there is a, a position, obviously there's disagreement, is what's often called the Nordic model because it was pioneered in Scandinavia. So right now in Austin, Texas, uh, if there is a commercial transaction around sex, both the 
woman who is selling and the man who is buying can be arrested. It is a crime for both. Right? The Nordic model says decriminalize prostitution for the seller. So the woman is not guilty, is not, cannot be charged with a crime. Re retain criminal penalties on the buyer. Right? In that way, when there's power differentials, you're not punishing the person on the bottom of the hierarchy. Right? That like anything else, there are debates. What does the data show? Uh, to the best I can read the data and the research, the Nordic model is effective in reducing harm to women. The harm reduction model, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that everybody who pursues it is somehow morally bankrupt. I mean, I think these are debates that have to be had. And we're talking about the, the lives of real people on the street who are some of the most vulnerable human beings in our society. Women who are prostituted on the street and also women who are prostituted in escort services, which are sometimes glorified, to, you know, prettied up to make it sound like, well, that's, you know, Hollywood kind of stuff. Those are real risks and real harms, right? And I think the abolition perspective and the Nordic model are the best way to get toward a better world. But, re you know, as I always say in class, reasonable people can disagree. And part of what this book is an attempt to do is say, here's some basic definitions. Let's get clear on what we mean by terms, and then let's figure out where we disagree right? and try to, to pursue those disagreements in a way that leads to something productive. It doesn't always happen.